Today we're going to talk about a hero from 1940 who used his scientific acumen to turn babies into men that were immediately shipped off to war to die. Let's talk about Dr. Hormone. Welcome to Comic Tropes. I'm your host, Chris. I love talking about Golden Age comics with you guys. We've seen some crazy stuff over the years, like Number 711, the man who was sent to prison, tunnels out of it to fight crime at night, and then voluntarily goes back to prison first thing in the morning. We've talked about Dynamite Thor, the man who solves every problem with a stick of dynamite, but we've never seen a hero who straight up commits war crimes with science. But that's what we're going to talk about today, because in 1940, Dell Comics unleashed onto an unsuspecting readership Dr. Hormone, beginning in Popular Comics issue number 56. Without any further ado, let me walk you down the path of Dr. Hormone. The first issue begins with an elderly man on his deathbed, his granddaughter Jane is with him, and some unnamed doctor is overseeing him. But the man on his deathbed is the titular character, Dr. Hormone. His name is literally Dr. Hormone, which in my opinion means one of two things. Either his parents gave him a very specific name that was sending him down a very specific career path, or I will argue this is more likely, he gave himself that name. As in, he had such a big ego, he named himself after his field. Now, you'd have to have a big ego for that. You know, the kind of ego that would bypass the traditional scientific method and go straight to human trials. So yes, Dr. Hormone is elderly, he's on his deathbed, but he wants to use his scientific acumen, his study of hormones on himself. He tests this on himself, and it works. What it does, his hormones turn him into a young man, specifically age 25. Age 25. Very precise. Too precise? You be the judge. But what I will judge is the poor lettering. There are so many word balloons and panels in Dr. Hormone comics where the last few letters are just jammed right up against the border. It's a lot like a man who constantly has too much to say on a birthday cake. The kind of lettering that's made with the sort of optimism that makes you think you have the whole world to conquer, only to realize that cakes, just like comic book panels, have a set amount of space to work with. So we now go to the fictional nation of Novoslavia, which is giving a $25 million prize to anyone who can help protect them against neighboring Eurasia. If we account for inflation, $25 million in 1940 means about half a billion dollars today. That is a stunning amount of money to put up as a prize for an idea to defend your country. Money that I argue would be better spent on actual weapons or training, things like that. Uh, to be fair, the comic book does address that idea. One of the Nova Slavian leaders points out that their problem is that they have only 10 million people versus Eurasia's 200 million. So at a certain point, weapons wouldn't make the biggest difference. These were real fears that people had in 1940, especially as the Nazis kept conquering Europe. These fears are represented by Nova Slavia's top military commander, General Battlesky. General Battlesky. Now that is a name that would make any G.I. Joe team member jealous. You think guys that got codenames like Skidmark or Colonel Courage wouldn't have preferred to be called Battlesky? You can battle try again, brother. Dr. Hormone and his granddaughter Jane arrive in Nova Slavia, and he asks the local taxi driver to be careful because his luggage is worth $25 million to him. And then Dr. Hormone is surprised when the guy steals it in the next panel. Perhaps don't go announcing how much your luggage is worth, sir. The Nova Slavian Prime Minister, Smartenov, is excited to welcome Dr. Hormone, although his defense minister, Rasinov, 
calls him a fake, since he didn't bring any actual materials to back up his scientific claims. Dr. Hormone takes the abuse while Jane literally drops a pill into Rasinoff's drink. The heroes opt to roofie their opponent rather than use that pill to prove their own scientific claims. Drugging somebody's coffee with your weird scientific chemicals. Uh, just to be clear, this is pretty much the least of Dr. Hormone and Jane's crimes. Kind of an appetizer of what to come. This is more like if somebody pulled you over for speeding and inside you were using scientific chemicals that hadn't been tested on innocent people. Even though Rasinoff is getting drugged, we're clearly supposed to not like him because not only does he think Dr. Hormone is a fake scientist, he literally says he's with his so-called granddaughter. That's a harsh accusation. The lack of scientific materials ends up getting Dr. Hormone and Jane thrown in a jail cell. Hey, what did the hormone say to the jail cell? I'm just passing through. <laughs> This has not been a great endorsement for Nova Slavian tourism, has it? Come to help us, you'll get mugged and be thrown into jail within minutes. Rasinov was dosed with donkey hormones and turns into a half-man, half-donkey. That is absolutely not how hormones work. To better understand hormones, let's go over to the Comic Tropes Science Lab. Hormones are chemicals that our organs send to each other to provoke some sort of a response. For instance, if we're thirsty, the kidneys get a hormone signal to release water into the bloodstream, which actually makes the bladder fill with more condensed urine. There are also hormones that do things aside from needing to make you pee. One thing that they can't do, create animal DNA. But yeah, Dr. Hormone's work apparently also includes genetic tinkering, and it's only going to escalate from here. By the way, Jane is a delight, as she calls Rasinoff, Asinoff, and that is a pun that I cannot top. Turns out Rasinoff is a spy for Eurasia, and he uses his new donkey powers to kick Dr. Hormone and knock him out. Rasinoff flees with Dr. Hormone to a plane, but then he just leaves Dr. Hormone behind for some reason. As Rasinoff escapes, he tosses the pilot out. We get to see the split second before the pilot turns into a bag of blood, and Dr. Hormone's response to this is incredibly casual. Dead or alive, that guy does nothing but make trouble for us, Janie. Whew. Rasinoff makes nothing but trouble for you. A man just died inches from you, but you're worried about the hassle that it causes for you. I think this gives us a bit of an idea of how much Dr. Hormone respects human life. That much! Dr. Hormone is given the prize money by Novoslavia, and then he says that it's the exact amount of money that he'll need to build a lab to produce hormones that will help Novoslavia defend itself. So does this all make Dr. Hormone a hero, or somebody that just wasted a plane ticket? Dr. Hormone sets up a new lab and lets Jane play around on the equipment. He lets the Prime Minister Smartenoff know that he's kind of guessing on the science this time around, and he needs another human volunteer. Smartenoff gets excited at the idea of being 25 years old again, so he volunteers, and the experiment utterly fails with the Prime Minister dying. Then Jane accidentally turns on the so-called angstrom ray machine, which makes everything work, and Dr. Hormone is like, oh yeah, I completely forgot about that part. Dr. Hormone just built this machine, and he forgot to turn it on. I don't care how smart he is. If he's forgetting basic stuff like turn the machine on, I'm worried about what else he's forgetting. Oh, looks like I forgot to put the hormones in the needle that I just injected into you, sir. Oh, what does that mean? Uh, well, that means it's full of air and you're gonna die in a few seconds. My bad. <laughs> Dr. Hormone uses his science on a baby, which turns him into a 25-year-old man, but with the mind of an infant. That won't work. 
So, Nova Slavia has their Boy Scouts volunteer for war, and Dr. Hormone turns the kids into men. Phrasing. But remember, that's only physically. Mentally, these are all still kids. Kids that can't give their consent to go off to war and die for their nation. Buddy, you just commit a war crime. War crime. Also, couldn't they have used this science on Novoslavia's elderly and infirm, turned them into an army? Of course they could have, but Dr. Hormone wanted to use it on kids. We cut to the enemy nation of Eurasia, and this page shows us that it's meant to be a stand-in for the Soviet Union, as their capital is called the Kremlin instead of the Kremlin, and their leader is flat-out Stalin. Or maybe Tom Selleck? That is one hell of a mustache. He also calls Rasinov Asinov, just like Jane did. So either his own friends already wanted to call him that, or for some reason, Rasinov complained to his comrades about the insult and it stuck. Either way, he's now called Asinov. Eurasia begins a massive invasion, and credit where it's due. For 1940, this artwork by artist Bob Bug is pretty engaging and exciting. Bug drew professionally straight out of high school for various magazines and comic publishers until shipping off to serve in the army in 1942. When he finished his service, he worked primarily in advertising as well as comic strips. For instance, he was the assistant on Dennis the Menace for 10 years starting in 1972. One of the fascinating things about looking at Golden Age comics is viewing them in historical context. We've got the advantage of time. And it's interesting because World War II, things were changing really fast. It's interesting to see how Russia was viewed because uh, in 1939, for instance, USA, really not big fans of the Soviet Union. They had invaded Poland and Finland. We weren't too big fans of them, but then the Nazis conquered France in 1940, and President Roosevelt began some friendly talks with the Soviet Union in July of 1940. This comic came out in August of 1940, but obviously it would have had to have been in the works several months earlier, back when we thought the Soviets were bad guys. That changed for a little while during World War II. Just interesting to view it in that historical context. In a rare move for comics at the time, Dr. Hormone's story was serialized, ending on a cliffhanger at the end of the first issue and picking up as the war between Novoslavia and Eurasia begins. Bob Bug clearly enjoys drawing this stuff the most. Later panels will have completely non-existent backgrounds during dialogue scenes. He far prefers the big action stuff and vehicles. The second story begins with General Battlesky throwing Dr. Hormone in jail because he didn't stop the invasion. It doesn't make sense, but just go with it because while Jane is sure they'll be executed, Hormone is confident that he has a plan and he just isn't telling anyone because it's way more dramatic that way. The prison is bombed and Hormone escapes, carrying the Prime Minister. Jane makes a joke about taxi prices, showing that this kid isn't afraid of death at all. She's awesome. But then, Battlesky immediately puts them all in front of a firing squad. Yes, even the Prime Minister, which means Battlesky has successfully engaged in a coup. Fortunately for Hormone and his allies, a Eurasian bomb goes off, and that's enough of a distraction to allow them to run all the way to the airport and hijack a plane. There's a chase from a tank, and then there's some dog fighting. But the important thing is that Hormone drops some chemical warfare on the Eurasian army. These hormones specifically make the invaders love Novoslavia, and they lose all interest in war. I'm pretty sure hormones can't make you like a specific nation, but that is still an example of Dr. Hormone using chemicals on people. In 1907, the United States led a coalition of a ton of nations across the world to agree to the Hague Convention. Now, that called for a ban on chemical weapons and chemical warfare during wartime. So, for those keeping track at home, that means this is the second war crime that Dr. Hormone has committed. 
with the first being sending those children off to war. War crime. Dr. Hormone has a conversation with the Prime Minister and Jane, and then all of a sudden they're parachuting, meaning that these panels all represent them having a discussion while flying in the plane. That's just an example of that lack of backgrounds I was talking about earlier. As soon as Hormone gets to the ground, Battlesky rewards him with a medal, and he does that in time for Hormone's abandoned plane to crash behind them. Battlesky just went from being willing to kill Dr. Hormone and the Prime Minister to rewarding Dr. Hormone with a medal in the time that it takes an airplane to fall out of the sky. Uh, this guy is pretty emotional. Dr. Hormone, you might want to cook up some of those special hormones to calm this firecracker down. But my favorite part about this is that earlier, Dr. Hormone wasn't worried about the firing squad because he had a plan. His plan was apparently to escape when Eurasia dropped a nearby bomb and be able to run all the way to the right plane where he could drop his happy hormones, which he hadn't bothered to tell the army about. That is a lot of variables to account for, Doctor. You would make Jigsaw jealous. I anticipate the possibilities and let the game play out. I want to play a game. This was definitely a wild comic for Dell to produce, but Dell Comics has an incredible history. They published a comic as early as 1929, and at one point, they were absolutely the biggest publisher, thanks mostly to licensed stuff like Mickey Mouse, incredibly popular for its time. They weren't super into superheroes early on. They mostly were buying pre-packaged comics that were created by various studios that would sell them to publishers. That was pretty much just the standard at the time. They didn't really move past their sci-fi and funny animal books until the early 60s when they experimented a little with superheroes, stuff like Solar, Man of the Atom, and Magnus, Robot Fighter. The Nova Slavian War with Eurasia, featuring recurring villain Asinov, ran from issues 54 through 57. Interestingly, Asinov himself is never arrested or killed off. The last time we see him, he and the leader of Eurasia are commanding forces against Nova Slavia. Issue 56 features Asinov bombing Nova Slavia with poison gas. Then, Asinov goes undercover as Dr. Hormone with the clever disguise of a doctor's mask and a fedora. This fools everyone, and he uses the stuff Dr. Hormone had originally brought to Nova Slovia in the first issue. Remember the stuff that got stolen in the taxi? This turns normal citizens into full-fledged talking animals, which seems to amuse the Prime Minister. Smart Enough makes jokes about a kangaroo picking pockets that I just don't get. The kangaroo then says that he has a pouch for bombs. Bombs for Eurasia. These two nations have such inherent hostility and a bad history that I'm really not sure that some hormone therapy is going to solve things long term. One man turns into a dog and the Prime Minister jokes that that man is anemic and orders him to bleed for them while chuckling. A bunch of Nova Slavian airmen are turned into birds. Battle Sky is, again, ready to kill Dr. Hormone when Asinov's ears pop up and ruin the disguise. Apparently, Asinov was able to simply run away because in the next page, he happens to come across Dr. Hormone in the woods. And if you thought that the artist skipping drawing that escape was bad, just try to reconcile what gets skipped between these two panels. In this one, Dr. Hormone is about to fight Asinov. And then in the next one, Asinov is kidnapping Jane, and you have to look in the background to see this silhouette of a knocked out Dr. Hormone. We missed the whole fist fight. This issue does end on a good cliffhanger. Jane's been kidnapped and the Nova Slovian Eagles are carrying bombs to Eurasia, but Hormone explains that their transformation is temporary and they'll soon revert to people possibly while still in the air. Issue 57 is the final issue with Asinov. He sends a broadcast to Hormone and Nova Slavia that he has Jane as a hostage. So, all those eagles return home, and Hormone surrenders himself to the enemy. 
But what they don't know is that Hormone has transformed Novoslavian soldiers into man-sized locusts and rats. They begin to plague Eurasia, while Hormone and Jane are put in an overly elaborate trap designed to drown them in two weeks' time. They're even given life jackets to prolong the trap. They could get away. No, no, no. I'm going to leave them alone and not actually witness them dying. I'm just going to assume it all went to plan. What? The Eurasians used poison gas to kill the Nova Slavians that were turned into rats. It's told to us in passing in only one panel. But the locusts swarm Eurasia, and they destroy planes, they destroy manufacturing plants, and they even destroy tanks. Don't know how they did that one. As Hormone recites the Lord's Prayer, ready to die, a gigantic, disgusting locust man saves him. Jane says that she's ready for a nice cool bath, which sounds like an absolutely terrible way to relax after almost being drowned. I can stay wet and cold? Where do I sign up? The next two issues change things up. An American spy says Nazis are planning to invade America, so they need Dr. Hormone back at home. But Nazis were listening in on this, and they kidnapped Dr. Hormone and Jane onto a U-boat. However, they didn't plan on one thing. That Dr. Hormone refuses to follow any ethical standards whatsoever, and has carried a bunch of Nova Slavian soldiers with him that he's turned into literal fleas. How horrific is their fate? Well, when Dr. Hormone asks them if they'd like to risk being turned back into men, a flea soldier claims he would rather be a dead man than a living flea. If you're keeping track, that's yet another crime against humanity that Dr. Hormone has committed. So, how do you make a hormone? You pay her. <laughs> how do you make Dr. Hormone moan? You give him human lives to play with. The flea men have the proportionate strength of fleas and quickly defeat the Nazis. The Nazi sub-captain blows a hole in the hull to sink the U-boat and kill Dr. Hormone. Then things get extra crazy. A flea man seals the metal hull back with his super strength, but everybody is still sinking from the water that the U-boat took on. The captain, who seconds ago was ready to die to kill them, says he may as well tell them how to push the water out with a switch, because his men are cowards and would probably tell them how to do that anyway. That Nazi U-boat captain changed his mind faster than General Battlesky, so if I was Dr. Hormone, I'd just be walking around all the time with that hormone that makes people love Nova Slavia. It would solve a lot of problems. The next two issues involve Dr. Hormone on a train to Washington, D.C., along with the five flea men from Nova Slavia, which I guess means that they felt that they owed the mad doctor some sort of life debt. It turns out that the Ku Klux Klan are working with the Nazis, and they blow up a bridge to derail the train. But the flea men just run alongside the train, lift it, and jump over the ravine with the train. Dr. Hormone and his team make it to Washington, then immediately get on another train, which the KKK ambush. But this time, the flea men are nowhere to be seen. As the villains tie Dr. Hormone and Jane to burning crosses, a bunch of the KKK starts chatting and we see that it's the flea men in disguise. Dr. Hormone anticipated this. And then they somehow summon millions of fleas which put out the fire, and then they start biting the KKK so badly that the bad guys all voluntarily blow themselves up rather than itch. This brings us to the final issue featuring Dr. Hormone, and I gotta say, you're not prepared for how crazy this gets. You're just not. Dr. Hormone is working in a lab for the USA when he hears a command to come to him from someone known as the Thinker. Dr. Hormone and Jane travel to a mountain where some KKK members try to kill them. They shove Hormone and Jane off a cliff, but the duo are able to walk across clouds. The KKK follows, but the thinker says he thinks death, and then the racists all fall to their deaths. A Nazi plane shows up and tries to gun down Dr. Hormone, but now Dr. Hormone has a potion that gives him super breath 
and he blows the plane away. Hormone and Jane fly in the plane, who knows where, and then they jump out in parachutes. As they descend, they see that they're actually going back in time. They see all different eras of mankind, and it's all going in reverse. What is going on here? I do not know. When they land in the primordial fires of an Earth before life existed, they are burned. And Hormone and Jane walk up to a Greek-looking temple. The Thinker commands them to rest, which they do. And the Thinker says that tomorrow they'll talk about the defense of the USA and how it's mankind's last hope. And that is how these stories end, with Dr. Hormone taking a nap. That's where Dr. Hormone's story ends. Not exactly on a cliffhanger since he's taking a gentle nap, but certainly unfinished. At the same time, this was pretty common for a lot of Golden Age comics, and I think it's a reason why a lot of Golden Age characters are forgotten. The publisher would sometimes just decide to drop that feature, and it was never finished, it was never completed, it was easy for people to forget about that story if it doesn't have an ending, uh, or if it was short-lived. At the same time, wild comics like this from the Golden Age really show me how the medium of comics is just so fun and there's so few filters. It really shows you what you can get out there. It doesn't matter how crazy the idea is, if you're passionate about it, there's very little to block you from creating that story, drawing it, and getting it published, especially these days with the internet uh, and crowdfunding measures. But that's just some of why I love comics. It's it can be as crazy as you want it to be, and there's very little that will stop you from putting it out there. A lot less roadblocks than you'd have making, say, a big budget film, or even getting a book published these days. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. I know this was a weird one. I believe next week I'm going to be back with a historical look at a more recent comic book publisher from more the... Uh, the sort of Bronze Age moving into the Modern Age. I think that'll be a lot of fun. If you haven't already, please consider hitting like and definitely subscribe. That really helps the channel, it means a lot to me. If you want to support me even more, there's a link in the description for Patreon where you can support the show for as little as a dollar. Would mean a lot to me. Until I see you next time though, folks, keep reading comics. Thank you so much for watching this crazy episode. I had a blast reading these comics. Dr. Hormone is just a character that I've had in the back of my mind that I want to get to for a while. Finally had time. I had a lot of fun making this. I hope you had fun watching it. By the way, not everybody knows, but I do have a second YouTube channel that's also about comics. Maybe I should call it Comic Tropes too. I don't know. But I call it Pros and Cons, okay? There's always a link in the description to it. And every Monday I do a two hour or so live stream where I talk about the latest comic book news and I do mini reviews of some of the biggest comics that have come out that week. If there's time, we do other fun things. There's always a live chat to talk to. Uh, sometimes we'll do quizzes, or maybe I'll do some drawing. And we do interviews. We've had some pretty big names pop up on there. Uh, also, if you look at the Pros and Cons channel and subscribe to that, I've got a new show that will be coming out that I'm going to be doing with Jim Mafood, where we look at really bad schlocky movies. So, yeah, I don't know how we both plan on fitting it in, but we're, we're gonna try to do like a, a once a month show. I really think a lot of you will like it. We've been working on this for a while. It, it's gonna be a blast. So please consider checking out Pros and Cons if you'd like more content. If you want just the regular edited videos, that's what I'm keeping this channel for, and I'll see you real soon. Bye. When he finished his sentence, <laughs> sentence, not quite. When he finished it,